I'm Zehra, I'm the moderator for the panel, and I'm joined by this excellent uh, choice of panelists. Can I ask you to introduce yourselves, please? Hello, I'm Brent Williams. I'm the founder and CEO of Benakiva. I'm Satya Setu Raman. I lead the global insurance practice for UiPath. And I'm Samuel Falman. I'm CEO and co-founder of uh, Accurate. Thank you, and I'm Zehra. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Tazi. Uh, this panel is of you know, great interest for me because my dream is to make AI human usable by increasing human touch, where human is not necessarily a data scientist, any of you. So uh, I hope, you know, I, I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion uh, for all of us. Uh, so I have my questions and I'll ask you to, hand, to uh, handle them one by one. The first question is for you, Sam. Uh, and of course, I'll ask your opinions as well. So, why and where do we need the human touch? And where can we go with total automation? Sam, uh, would you like to take it? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, if we look at uh, what we do at Accurate, so we are providing a platform that automates significant part of the pricing process. And one of the first questions we always get is, but so you are trying to replace actuaries. Uh, and obviously, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely not the case. We always need to find a good trade-off between uh, human touch and, uh, and automation. Uh, why that? Because while there are some uh, very complex problem, pro problems for, for human beings that can be solved in a fraction of seconds by a machine, there are also uh, very uh, simple uh, problems for human beings that could be solved by a five-year-old child that cannot be solved by, by a machine. Uh, so we need to combine both. And if I, if I take an example, which I know uh, well, of course, because I'm, 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 in the, in the, I'm in the pricing area, but then we can generalize it to the, to the claims part as well. Uh, if, you, if you look at, at what we do, so automating the rate, uh, so rate making process, uh, what we're gonna automate is all the data-driven part of the process. So all, all what relies on, on data. And this is where uh, machines do have lots of added value, just applying statistics, uh, simulating all potential uh, solutions, and find the best one. Having said that, there is no, in, no insurance carrier that would put into production a model that is just out of a machine uh, without having it reviewed by experts. Because the experts, in our case uh, actuaries, are the people that do have the knowledge of the, the market, knowledge about the regulation, knowledge about the trends, and knowledge about all the elements that are not present in the data. So we absolutely need to have this, this, uh, this expertise. And the good thing with, um, with automation is that it's going to uh, actually enable this human touch because by automating, you are going to uh, decrease significant part of, of, of the time required to build the model itself and let much more time to the expert to apply its actual knowledge uh, and to take decisions. And taking decisions is, uh, and applying expertise is actually the human touch. And what I say here for pricing is basically exactly the same for, for claims. Uh, of course, if you can fast track uh, simple claims, it gives much more time for the experts, uh, so the claim handlers, to focus on complex claims. Uh, so therefore, I really think that automation is not at all uh, to be opposed with, uh, with human touch. Uh, I think automation enables human touch. Thank you so much. Uh, Satya, Brent, would you guys like to you know, express your opinions as well? Yeah, definitely. And uh, Sam uh, had a great point on the back office side where there is a decision making process that goes on. Absolutely, human touch is required. And also he touched upon the entire claim process itself, front office, middle office, and back office. What we have seen is <clears throat> when it comes to uh, the first notice of loss through settlement and closure, I had a claim with a direct-to-consumer insurer. I still, I started my claims journey in a mobile app, but still I need to make 18 calls. I'm, I need to make means I had 18 calls, in which six inbound calls, 12 outbound calls were made. Uh, so every time 
we need to talk to a human being when it comes to you know the reinforcement of claims claims handlers and adjusters both field adjusters as well as the liability adjusters that are sitting in the office to have that conversation and not only that we also need very importantly because the liability adjuster said that it is not your fault and they assured but for 3 weeks it did not move any status in my core system or you know that comes from the core system i was still paranoid i i made four more calls to the adjuster so insurance is a data business while insurance is a data business it's also a relationship business so front office to middle office to back office you must have human touch in every cycle of claims journey because that is the zero moment of truth yeah this is a great question um I built an entire company around the experience of claims and uh, I think it I think it lends itself to what type of experience versus what type of policy you're follow, you're filing a claim on. For example, if it's a if it's a pet insurance policy or a dental policy, a vision policy, a lot of those people don't even expect they expect to push a button on their phone and be done. That's the experience they expect. They expect that Amazon type experience. But when you look at a more detailed or complex claim such as long-term care claims or disability claims, those types of claims, you can automate a certain portion of those, but some of those claimants actually expect to be able to have that human interaction because they're going through a difficult time in their life. So, while I think automation can can automate a certain amount of claims and it could be argued you could automate every claim. Our vision is at some point a a policyholder or beneficiary won't even have to file a claim. Why? Because we have the data to know that we just need to pay a claim. But we're talking future forward of claims processing. So for now, I think it's just about finding where does it make sense to automate the process to allow the claim staff to have more time in their day to spend a little more time and give that human touch when it's needed. Perfect. I mean, uh, actually, when there is a claim, somebody is suffering, and uh, that might be actually an opportunity for the insurance company to show that they actually care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, th thank you so much. Thank thanks for those points. Um, uh, you know, we want, you know, as, as you brought up Amazon, you know, we want everything to be just through one click. And uh, uh, as the insurance companies uh, go through automation, uh, if it takes too long to implement, if it takes years to implement, then it's just very difficult to uh, actually have that automation take place. Uh, so my next question is, uh, were learn fast and adjust cycles uh, established and what benefits uh, were derived from them? Uh, Satya, would you like to take that question? Sure. The best two places to learn where to automate first are specifically in the commoditized area. And, and you brought an excellent point there. There are places where customer want, wanted to be get, get that done in, in a one and done fashion. You know, a first call resolution in, in some other situations, right? A glass claim where I don't even want to, you know, go through the hassles of talking to someone. Can I send a, you know, image? And can I just send a note, uh, first notice of loss? that gets solved through safe light, for an example. So these are the commodity situation where you can learn fast and then implement. And what we have also seen in the recent times of uh, the human churn that is happening, or employees churn that is happening, it's called a year of great resignation. But I would call 2019 itself is a year of great churn. Because we are seeing insurance specifically, the employees are getting out of the workforce, either through retirement, or natural churn. Some of the places like actuaries, you know, that Sam touched upon, actuaries are becoming data scientists. The same thing that we are looking at. So, your biggest bet is where the employees are do, doing this repetitive, mundane task, and then learn from those repetitive, mundane tasks, and automate that first. So, you are taking the biggest bank first from those employees. Here, we also talked about, you, you mentioned, Zara, about, uh, you know, where the implementation cycle is long to get into a digital transformation, right? So what happens that is, in the core system or digital systems, there are 120 tasks I do as a claims adjuster. In the core system, I do 30, 30 tasks, which are all decision-making tasks. And the other 90 that I do outside, 
Sometimes people try to call it as non-value add, like one of the claims manager was calling. I said, no, because if it is a non-value add, why somebody is doing for 30 years? It's not. This adds value to the 30 tasks that they are doing on decision making. These are critical steps, but these are the steps that are creating noise in the decision making. And one of the CEO was telling, I don't want my claims adjuster to be data movers. So those are the data moving tasks, those are the repetitive tasks, those are the 90, out of 90, even if you can automate 40 tasks outside those, that are the greatest candidate to learn and then automate. Perfect, thanks so much. And Brent, would you like to follow and Sam later? Thank you. Yeah, this is an interesting question because um, when we first started the research for uh, building Benakiva, you know, I got the opportunity to visit multiple carriers across the United States because prior to Benakiva, I had a very substantial financial advisory firm, so they wanted me to sell their products and services. And so when I went to visit these carriers, what I found was claim staff sitting in front of multiple monitors. On multiple monitors, there's multiple applications. Then you have multiple manual workaround processes that occur outside of these systems. And we just asked a simple question, would it be nice if you had one single system? And of course, the claim staff said, oh my gosh, my life would be so much better. <laughs> you know, now I can focus on the claims that I want to focus on. The struggle, though, is when most vendors go to a carrier, they look at all those different systems that they need the data from, and they tell the carrier, this is how we need the data, this is specific format, specific schema, and, we'll get, and we need you to build specific services so we can connect our technology. And therein lies the problem, because now the, the, the carrier has to go to all these different systems, figure out a, you know, the best way to extract the data. We're talking some of these are green screens still, the fact of the matter is they're still out there, right? And we still need the data out of them. And then it's a matter of putting in the specific schema and then a specific connection. So what we said was, we need to make sure that we take that burden off of the carrier. And when we go to a carrier, we say, just give us the data. We don't care what format it comes in. We don't care what schema. And you don't have to build a service for us. And we'll get you up and running. But that's a technological feat that most carriers, when you tell them that, they, they have disbelief, right? They don't, they, don't, they don't believe you can implement a platform in less than six months, right? Even though today it's being done all the time. We've done it 17 times, <laughs> so. Congratulations to you. <laughs> Sam, would you like to add anything on top of that? Yeah, so, yeah, this question is very interesting indeed. Uh, and when you talk about learn fast and, uh, and adjust on the claim side, uh, as you know, so the, the, the claims, it's also what, what's going to feed uh, the predictive models that you are going to use for, for pricing and under, under, underwriting. So while you are increasing automation on the, on, the, on the claim side, it means that you collect the data faster. Uh, and it definitely has lots of value uh, because then it's going to feed uh, the, the, the pricing part, the modeling part, uh, quite faster. And you know, when you put models to production, uh, it can, can be that those models start to derive, uh, which means uh, increase the loss ratio because of external factors. And recent COVID is certainly one of very good examples, something you, you could not uh, even anticipate. Can be also driven by competitors that are uh, suddenly starting to uh, better select risks, which means that you start attracting quite bad profiles in your, in your portfolio. and so. Uh, when the model derives, the faster you know it, the faster you are capable to bring back those, uh, those claims into your, your models, compare uh, what was actually happening with what you thought would, would happen, allow you to take corrective actions. And you know, in, in that case, uh, weeks makes a huge difference. It, it can allow to really to save, uh, to save millions. Uh, so that's that, that's really one of the key benefits of, uh, of automation across the, the whole uh, value chain. Thank you so much. I mean, it, this reminds me, uh, to learn fast and to adjust, you really need everybody on board. And uh, especially for insurance companies, uh, there are so many different backgrounds and departments and silos. So, uh, so uh, like automation actually might help and, and should help uh, in developing languages to communicate among everybody because it's really not about just automation processes it's really about uh, including people in those processes so that they are integral part of it because they have done it before 
and they just need to do it faster and better, serving customer better at the end. Uh, that's the whole purpose. Uh, so uh, that brings me to the next question. So uh, there are different people involved in uh, uh, claims, uh, during claims automation, and uh, you know, the insurance company uh, try, tries to actually uh, Auto, uh, optimize other things like profitability, reducing claims, uh, claims fraud. So, uh, and when you automat automatize things, uh, there is always the question of how are all those different KPIs I need to keep track of going? So, are they going in a direction that I can't, you know, follow anymore? Uh, how do I go back to uh, where I was or, or to a better place? So, so my next question is, how does claims automation increase? profitability uh, in relation to loss dependence uh, on the human touch and how does it reduce claims fraud? Uh, because it's, it's a very interconnected system. Uh, so so, so uh, I would like, please, Brent, to take this question and then uh, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, marrying uh, the claims experience and fraud together is something that you know, has to be done. And when we, when we talk about from a fraud perspective, what's interesting is when we talk to a lot of carriers, we'll say, you know, they're, we're talking about fraud on a specific product and we find out they're spending tons of money to prevent fraud on that specific product. But when you actually look at that product as maybe a small face amount, it's a small dollar amount. And even if you added in some of those fraud cases, and paid the claims, you're actually gonna pay out less than what you're paying to try, to try to prevent the fraud in the first place. So I think it's about analyzing which ones, you know, which, which portions of that you wanna actually tackle that are gonna drive true value to the carrier. Because if you're spending millions of dollars to prevent fraud to save hundreds of thousands, I would argue financially that doesn't make sense. You'd be better off not to even worry about it and just pay the hundreds of thousands, you know, because <laughs> you're gonna spend less money overall. Now, when you look at it from a customer experience perspective, that comes back to what type of experience is the carrier comfortable giving? Do they wanna truly give that Amazon type claims experience? For certain products, they may. For other products, they may not. It just depends on the, the, the amount of, of, of experience that they're willing to give. And from a fraud perspective, the nice thing about technology is when you have a partnership ecosystem, you can loop in a lot of those fraud detection tools, the fraud detection models into the claim process. So now you're actually getting the best of both worlds. You're providing that Amazon type claims experience while also you know, reducing or trying to eliminate the fraud. Thanks. Satya, would you like to add uh, anything? Yeah, uh, Brent provided an awesome point here. <laughs> uh, the cost attribution is no longer about can I save by shifting a job or automating it and save $15 per hour. This is, we need to look at from a broader perspective. I'm going to give a good story here. So I was doing uh, a reimagine and reboot session with one of the insurer in a subrogation department and uh, our re recoveries, the third party recoveries. And those people were telling, one of the analysts was telling that, uh, you know what, recently, when I receive a claim for third party, uh, from a third party insurer recovery, I found that we were not even, you know, when, when I called the other insurer, we found that the, neither customer, nor the other party, nor our claims handler, did even first notice of loss to those insurers, I need to sit for two hours in a call. This never happened three years ago or two years ago. This is happening right now because my contact center or the claims handlers, 20, 25% of them are less than one year experience or two years experience and they joined during the COVID time. They didn't, though they had all this standard operating procedure, they, they did, not time, did not have time to go through that. So shifting left, shifting the benefits left, this is not about saving them 10 minutes, 20 minutes time, how you can automate it upfront in the claims handler side itself, where they said that very clearly, claims handler was, were missing consistently 30 to 35% of the data to be collected from those claims. Though they had standard operating procedure, they still missed, or they were gathering the wrong type of data. 
So data collection upfront is very critical and automating upfront, shifting your automation left is very, very critical in this journey. When I say journey, this is not purely about customer journey. You should also look at it as an employee journey, right? Because an employee, when it, they are getting data from up, up front, they want all the data to be there to be a decision maker. So automating in different ways. And again, going back to the fraud analysis we are talking about, just think about if this claim has been there for 30 days and there is no first notice of loss with the other insurer, what is the propensity of increasing claims, uh, frauds? There is a higher propensity to, propensity to fraud when claims is pending for more than seven days. So you need to look at cost attribution in a little bit broader sense, both upstream and downstream, and also on the business KPI metrics that the cost is having impact on. Thank you so much, Sam. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, so probably I'm gonna yeah get back to my to my previous point, but uh, again, uh, I think autom automation uh, on the on the on the claim side, uh, as you as you mentioned, what's important is to uh, to to be able to assess cert certain uh, certain KPIs, and uh, it means that if you combine claims automation by automation on the modeling side, you have this capability to. Uh, much faster assess uh, the impact uh, on, on, the, on the loss ratios, uh, on the portfolio, uh, and so on, and so to, uh, to, take, uh, to take decisions faster. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, um, uh, my last question is about the customer experience. I mean, customer is obviously the apple of our eye, right? For everybody, you know, uh, we are at the end serving the, a customer and uh, and all of us depend on what they feel and they do about us. So my last question is about customer experience. But before I do that, I want to point out to the questions. So please scan the uh, QR code and please vote for the questions that you like because we'll probably not be able to answer all of them. So if you like a question, please upvote it so we are able to uh, answer the most important ones for all of you first. And we'll try to answer them. Of course, we are not claiming to answer them all, but yeah. Uh, so, so my last question, uh, how does claims automation increase uh, customer experience and satisfaction? And uh, you know, since Brent, you are closest to me, I'll, I'd like to start with you first and then uh, go in line. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've said for you know, the last 10 years, claims is a customer experience issue. And uh, I learned that during my, during my advisory practice, I was going through, the, unfortunately it was a death claim. And on one hand, I'm constantly apologizing for the archaic process. While on the other hand, I'm trying to serve the beneficiary and get them you know, through this process. And once the claim was completed, this was the moment that I learned truly that claims was a customer experience issue because you know, the beneficiary had, had told me as the advisor, as the, as the investment advisor, that they want to move all remaining products away from that company, including the business group products. So by running them through that one claims experience, I was ordered as the advisor to move all remaining business away from that carrier. And that's the struggle that I had as an advisor back then, you know, prior to to building what we built was, I can take you from one carrier to another, but I've been through all of the processes and they're all about the same. So we're not gonna solve the core issue of the experience of the claim process. And that's when we truly started diving into the research and understand, you know, what does the customer experience need to be for all parties involved? Because when you talk about customer experience, most people automatically think about the policyholder and beneficiary, which is obvious. We need to give them that claims you know, experience, that Amazon type experience. But what most people forget is while you build a, a system for, for that experience, you also have to tend to the customer experience of the internal claims and servicing staff, right? What is their experience like? And then you have to extend that out to, okay, what is the customer experience for the agents and advisors? And then even extend beyond that, what is the customer experience for all other third parties involved in the claims experience? 
So when you look at a claims experience, our thought process was is we need to look at all of those experiences and give all of those parties that Amazon type claims experience. Because claims is a customer experience issue. I've said it for years, I've been in this industry for 20, 20 years. The sole purpose of an insurance carrier is to pay a claim. If you can't get that right, you probably shouldn't be in the business. Perfect, thank you so much. Yes, how about you Satya? Uh, so, it's, it's very interesting again Brent. Um, when, when we talk about customer experience, again uh, Brent mentioned about there are different types of policies or different types of products or different types of claims. So where there needs to be one and done, you can absolutely solve it by, uh, you know, digital, uh, through digital means. But most of the time that doesn't happen. Uh, so when it comes to those sort of heavy touch processes, what we have seen is, again, how fast a claim handler can gather data and how accurately from the claim, when, when they make the outbound call to the customers, number one. Second thing, how, how much reassurance they are able to give and also follow up through with the next step immediately, how fast they can do that, and how do you automate that improving customer experience. And the third step is how they are planning to do the final closure of the claim and follow up on that. Because a lot of times, as I mentioned, there may be, the insurer may determine that, okay, you are not at fault, but ultimately that is not reiterated. You get a email or letter that, okay, the other insurer is not accepting, so, you know, this is not in my situation. Like, I have seen in different situations where customers say this, I don't know what to do. One of my cousins said that, I said, just keep quiet. <laughs> they, they will figure it out, because they said that you can get your lawyer to contest it. What does it even mean? I, the normal customers don't know. You have to explain to the customer. So giving the right explanation and putting a communication plan to the customer is very, very important. And most importantly, look at customer as a comprehensive 360 degree view. Not looking at customer that way will also create noise. This is on the benefit side. There is a life, in, life and benefit insurer who also has uh, an annuity plan. A customer first uh, submitted for short-term disability. Then after two months, the customer also wanted a hardship loan. They asked the same documents because that goes to a different annuity team or the retirement team. They needed same document. Within the organization, there is a so much of data disconnect. They are not looking at com customer comprehensively. The next worst thing happened. Now the customer wanted to convert that short-term disability into long-term disability. They asked the same set of documents. It needs to be incremental. They need a new doctor's report or physician's report to convert it, that they need more care for a longer time, but not. They asked the same set of documents. So that creates a lot of noise for the customer and connecting the customer data of the entire organization, not just for marketing purpose, because we see insurers do a lot of marketing by connecting customer data, but when it comes to customer service, the data fall through the gap. Aggregating that data, looking at the customer comprehensively and serving the customer will absolutely increase the customer experience. Thank you, Satya. Sam, would you like to add anything? Or yeah, maybe maybe a quick, a quick comment. So of course, no doubt, uh, Automation brings speed, and, uh, and speed increases uh, customer uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, no doubt about this. I think uh, this this reasoning can be applied at you know other uh, other part. Uh, and typically, if you look at uh, underwriting, especially product development, uh, it's pretty much the same. Usage usage are changing, and customer are expecting to have insurance products that are really covering uh, their needs in terms of, of insurance. So having this capability to uh, faster uh, put insurance products, new insurance products on the market that really fit with clients' expectation is also uh, something that increases client uh, client satisfaction. And again, uh, automation the, the capability of of very rapidly uh, creating a new product uh, through uh, automated uh, platforms and uh, automated models uh, increase customer satisfaction the same way uh, uh, fast claim settlements increase customer satisfaction. Thanks so much. So, uh, I mean, my take out of this is, yes, you should automate, automate things uh, and not just customer, but for employee experience, for everybody's experience. Uh, but when you automate things, if things go wrong, 
uh, there should be ways for everyone to voice what's going wrong and uh, make it right. Uh, so, so automation should not be uh, serving just people who cannot afford uh, human experience. So, so, so it should help where things take a lot of time, can be automated, but if automation goes wrong, then there should be ways to uh, understand that something is wrong and, and you know, just help make it right. So uh, we have great questions and you guys are such a great audience. You know, this is like a dance. You answered immediately to my request. Uh, so uh, we have great questions. Uh, how much time do we have left? Uh, I just want to make sure. Well, five minutes, perfect. Okay, so uh, the first one is, um, actually it's a question I love. So for years, everyone wants to automate parts of the claims process. But what specific examples do you think would be most impactful right now with carriers? Obviously, I mean, if claims was a very simple process, there would be one you know, robot that does everything, right? So, so there are so many things that need to be done in the whole process, tens of uh, you know, uh, process steps uh, in every steps, in every, you know, uh, in every uh, unit. So, uh, so which, uh, which parts? Uh, you know, are the most inf impactful uh, when you think of the automation, claims automation. Uh, so who would like to take that question? I can start. Um, okay. it's, a, it's a great question. And what a lot of people don't understand is for every one claim, um, there are hundreds of sub-processes that have to occur from a regulatory perspective and, and from a monitoring perspective that have to occur in order to process that one claim. So we often hear, you know, upper executives in organizations will say, well, a claim is a claim is a claim. Yeah, then, then go talk to the people who are processing them because they'll tell you about the hundreds of processes they have to do in order to process that one claim. So I think it's about looking at what are those sub-processes that have to occur from a regulatory perspective. A great example right out of the box is, is correspondence, right? For, there's regulatory components that say certain correspondence have to go out. You can automate that whole process. A human being doesn't have to be doing, you don't need a correspondence team doing correspondence tied to claims. If you have the right platforms in place, that all can be automated. Another one would be the regulatory rules, right? That can be automated. Um, we work with one, one of our large tier one carriers. Um, you know, it was interesting because we met this one gal who's been in the claims department 47 years. And they said, well, she can't go on vacation without us forcing her to take a laptop because there's so much in her mind that we may need to leverage while she's on vacation, which is wonderful that she's got all this knowledge. The question is, why isn't that knowledge transitioned into technology? Right? That's the question. Because once you transition that, then all of a sudden training is much easier. You don't have all the, you, you know, your employee costs are reduced because you're not training them for six months to process a claim. You put them in front of a platform and just do what the platform tells you to do. Thank you. Um, I mean, if you have something to add, we could take that. Otherwise, I can go to the next just question. Just one, one thing I want to do. And uh, there are ways to scientifically identify those processes yeah. through, you know, the recent, uh, you know, analyt analysis of process mining, those sort of capabilities that are emerging. Using those will provide a scientific way to identify those processes that can be automated initially. Got it. Okay. Um, my questions are gone, which means I'm out of time. So um, I want to thank you all, and, and I want to thank our listeners as well. Uh, my last question to the panel, panelists, I mean, there were lots of questions, and we couldn't answer them. Uh, where can people find you uh, if uh, they want to ask further questions, or if they just want to interview, with, just talk <laughs> with you, because you guys are just such great company. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Brent, Brent Williams, founder and CEO of Benekiva. We do have a booth over here, um, so you can certainly find us over there. But uh, yeah, we're, it's Brent at Benekiva.com. That's, that's the, quite so simply much. to get a hold of me. Thank you. Satya? Uh, you all can find uh, UiPath's awesome team there in uh, booth 11A and they discuss about uh, more use cases that we are automating in the insurance world. Yeah, same for us. We've got an amazing booth uh, just at the entrance. Uh, with with uh, magic goodies and a wonderful team. So uh, if you want to talk about pricing, don't hesitate. 
Thank you so much. And I'm, we have a booth, Tazi, D8. And if you want to demystify AI, come to me, because I have done it for 20 years. <laughs> Actually, no, 30 years. God, I'm getting old. So uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to demystify it and use it, just come and find me. Thank you all so much. Have a great lunch.